All right, so it appears that we are live. I'm here today with David, Gil David Giltner. This is a live taping. So David, this is a few minutes uh, in the beginning. We relaxed, just saying hi to everyone who's watching. So welcome, Sounds David. Good. Thank Super you. Glad to have you here. Super um, excited to be here. Yeah, it's exciting for me too, uh, especially given uh, the, your, your particular focus and what you do. Uh, relating related to taking you know making scientists cross that that frontier <laughs> mm, the frontier uh, yeah that's a good term <laughs> into the un, into the unknown right <laughs> into the unknown yeah um so i want to welcome anyone who's watching if you're watching and uh, the sound is not okay or there's some there's some issue feel free to uh to uh, if you're you know watching on youtube or linkedin or facebook to send a message i will see the message here on the right of my of my uh, kind of uh, uh, studio I have here. <laughs> and uh, we're just preparing. This is a live taping of uh, my interview with David Giltner that we have titled and suggested by David, um, Research Mindset versus Development Mindset. Do, do scientists need to choose? And I, I, you know, David asked me or mentioned this, and I really, really liked this point of view. Um, because often we do have this feeling that it's a frontier, it's hermetic in a way, it's airtight, and once you cross, you can't come back. You know, there's so much around this 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 transition to be it industry or or the public sector, etc. You know, out of academia, there's so much. Uh, uh, so many things, uh, so, so many feelings around that, that uh, yeah, I'm really glad to have this conversation with David today. Yeah, good. I'm looking forward to it. I think it's an interesting topic as well. Yeah. Uh, so, David, we, we've been live for uh, more or less two minutes. Uh, I mm -hmm. think we can go. Um, and one thing I do want to do is, um, pres is you know, tell the people who are watching who you are. And for that, I'll just look at my notes here. Um, there we go. If I go here. There we go. All right. So uh, unless, David, you have any questions, we're, we're going to start. This is going to be more or less you know, 40 minutes of conversation. Mm -hmm. um, and Sounds great. And what I'll do, given so I it seems it seems to me that you said that you're okay. There's no no specific question, so I right. think we can start. Yeah, let's go ahead and get started. So uh, I want to welcome everyone to this new episode of Papa PhD. Uh, in this case, we're taping it live right now uh, on LinkedIn and YouTube, and I am here today with David Giltner. David has spent more than twenty years developing cutting edge photonics technology into commercial products in the fields of optical communications, remote sensing, directed energy, and scientific instrumentation. In 2017, he started Turning Science to provide training and support for scientists of all disciplines seeking to enter the private sector as employees, collaborators, or entrepreneurs. David is the author of the books Turning Science into Things People Need and It's a Game, Not a Formula and is an internationally recognized speaker and mentor on the topics of technology, commercialization, product development, and career design. He has a bachelor's and a PhD in physics and holds seven patents in the fields of laser spectroscopy and optical communications. And like I said, what we're going to talk about today, the subject is going to be research mindset versus development mindset. Do, do these mix? Do, don't, don't they mix? This is what we're going to talk about. But first, uh, David, welcome. I'm super happy to have you here. Is there something else you'd like to add to the, the short presentation I did of, of your of what you've what's brought you here today? Uh, sure. I mean, as far as what brought me to here, maybe that's what I'll talk about, because as you describe, so I started in physics and I built a career a uh, couple decades uh, in the private sector developing laser-based photonics-based products. Uh, but in the last four years, I've been doing something a bit different. It, it started with the book that I wrote, the first one, Turning Science into Things People Need in 2010. Started as a side project, uh, just speaking and occasionally on 
scientists who have transitioned into the private sector. But it became such a, a, a topic of interest, both in terms of the need. Mm -hmm. uh, as I started speaking about it, I found lots of scientists who struggled to make the transition. And honestly, I talked to a lot of managers in the private sector who struggled with their scientists who didn't understand the transition they had made. Mm -hmm. And in 2017, that's when I, I left my job and started doing this, uh, started turning science. And it's it's been quite a journey uh, just because of, you know, there's, there's so much in this topic of uh, industry and academia. And in much of what I do, I emphasize the differences because they are very different environments. Mm -hmm. One is for creating knowledge. The other is for creating a profit, creating solutions. Mm -hmm. But as you brought up this, this question of, I, th I think of there being a different mindset for each. And the question is, do we have to pigeonhole people in one or the other? Do we have to, it's kind of the tribal tendencies we humans have, I think, to move into one and say, well, this is the real place. This is where you make yeah. the best career. <laughs> and that is not productive. So without getting into it, any further right now, that's kind of what sets up this whole thing, mm. how I got to where I am uh, yeah. now. Yeah. What what I find very interesting uh, about what you just said and about th this arc of, of, your, of your story, let's say, is uh, the people aspect. So you, you kind of alluded to the fact that you you got the feeling, and I, 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 I'm sure you have numbers, that there's a lot of people out there that are asking themselves this question and that needed some help. And that mm -hmm. this is why I guess you said, okay, this is a real project. I'm going to go and help these people. Can you, can you give us a kind of a landscape of the, the, maybe the number, but also the types of people that, that come to you or that, that you help and you know, what, what type of transitions they're trying to bring into their professional life more specifically? Yeah. So I think the two big categories of people that I work with, there are obviously a lot of uh, graduate students uh, usually about to get their PhD. And they're mm -hmm. thinking that's sort of the point when they realize, hey, maybe there aren't enough positions in academia, or maybe that's not the career that I want anyway. That's yeah. That was me. And <laughs> how do I move into this world that is completely unknown? We, we can be almost 30 years old, maybe older by the time we get our PhD, and yet we have yeah. no idea what industry is about. And generally, our professors can't help us. I recall the, the conversation with my advisor uh, when I told her that I wanted to go into the private sector instead of mm -hmm. the career path to a professor. And you know, she, she said, if you want a postdoc, I can hook you up. I've got connections, mm -hmm. and I knew she did. But I'm afraid if you want to go into the private sector, you're on your own because I don't know yeah. anything about it. And this is, you know, so this is the one group. The other group are scientists that have transitioned into the private sector and they're working in a company and their technical skills are very valued. And their manager knows that they have good technical skills, but the working habits that they brought come from academic research. Yeah. And they're struggling to figure out uh, this is a different environment. And I'm not quite getting it. That is really the topic behind, you know, the, mm. my second book. It's a game, not a formula, right? It's a because that's yes. kind of the key message. It's we talk about. It's easy to talk about skills and knowledge and what skills and knowledge would an employer need, and that's important. But that's actually not the big gap. The biggest mm. problems are in working habits and how you think about playing the game or not. That's where the big mm -hmm. and that's the bulk of what I do. It's it's interesting because it's true that conversations be it on twitter on you know about this question of career readiness etc cetera, etc cetera, and and transitioning often mm -hmm. gravitate towards um you know listing your uh, core competencies your your transferable right. skills which i i agree it's it's an aspect mm -hmm. but uh, from my experience and from the conversations i've had the big shock uh, people get when transitioning is more the culture like Kind of, you know, to resume to resume it in one word, the culture, yes. and uh, and I, I find it really interesting. And actually, can you show uh, the book again? Because this is really it's a, a new book, right? It is. It's actually this is a this is a preprint, a mock up. Uh, it will be out within a week or so. Actually, um, this is but perfect. This is the cover. Yeah, yeah. So go ahead, go ahead. Well, you, you but you're exactly right. We hear so much about skills transferable skills. This is a great, wonderful concept. It's very important, 
Uh, many times PhDs will think about the knowledge that they've gained in their five, six, seven years working on their PhD and wonder how that will be applicable in the private sector. All of that's relevant. Skills and knowledge get talked about a lot, though, because they're easier to talk about. Skills and knowledge are easy to put on a resume, on a CV. Yeah. They're easy to train because of things we learn. The things that don't get, and, and so that's fine, and it's a valuable discussion, but the part that Gelfin gets missed is use the word culture. I think that's a good way to think of it. I often talk about it's, it's the habits that you have because mm -hmm. the fact that academia and industry have very different goals, one is for creating knowledge, one is for creating profit, the working habits that bring success are different. Mm -hmm. And yet a PhD is trained to be independent. This is how they're, we're, we're different than somebody who graduates with a bachelor's. You've gained a few skills, but you kind of know you're green. You know you don't really know how things work. And so you're ready for somebody to teach you. But a PhD has been trained to be independent. Yeah. And then when they move into the private sector, it turns out some of those habits do need to change. And that is one of the biggest gaps. It's one of the biggest gaps I hear from the job seekers. You know, when they're told things like they're too smart for the job or they're overqualified, yeah. usually those are euphemisms. What they are, <laughs> what the manager is saying is that they don't understand what we need here. And this is what the managers will talk about too. Uh, th basically they say they don't really understand what we're trying to do here. It's no longer about spending years on an interesting problem. It's about delivering a solution in nine months. Yeah. And it's, that's and here, the difference. It's, fun, it's, it's interesting because I was going to, I was going to go to the time frame aspect of projects and of mm -hmm. research versus, you know, uh, industry commercial projects. And, um, in the conversation I had kind of, you know, some time ago with, uh, with Simon Moore, he said, or, or maybe maybe with, with Chris, um, uh, well, now the name is escaping me, but th they said one of the big differences is one thing they learned when, go when going to the private sector was a project has, depending, maybe two months to prove itself within a company before it's dropped. Mm -hmm. And in research, you can dig much longer into, into something without this expectation of dropping it and, and switching to something else. I, I think this is a big, one of these big mindsets, you know, switches and maybe shocks people might have, right? It is, it is. I think two months can be accurate. It depends on the industry. Sometimes you'd yeah. have longer, but that is absolutely correct. When the goal is profit, efficiency is important. And it's important that you work on something that will ultimately make money. And that is uh, one of the big differences is the time frame. Um, you know, I, I like to say in academia, you're pursuing a full understanding. And if you're not sure about something, you dig and you look more. You know, I, hmm. I, I like to say there's a different response to uncertainty. It's in, in academic research, it's more, I'm not sure, I'm not certain, so let's keep looking. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. In industry, I'm not sure. So let's try something and, and move forward. You know, it's, it's a different response to that. Yeah. Um, so that's absolutely true. And I think that leads to a lot of the differences in the habits. Uh, one big one is making decisions. This is one of the big complaints that I have heard from all the industry managers that I've interviewed. And I've seen it myself as a, as a manager, the typical PhD, struggles to make decisions because they're used to working until they achieve certainty. This mm -hmm. is what <laughs> academic research is about. You keep going until you know, and then you publish. You don't publish something saying, well, we kind of think it's probably this. That would not work. But if you, in industry, once you transition into the private sector and you tell your boss that they, a question might come up, okay, I asked you to evaluate three different possible paths for this new product. We have a customer who needs it in nine months. What's your recommendation as to the path forward? Mm -hmm. And if you say, well, I don't know yet, I need two more months or two more years of, <laughs> of data or analysis, that doesn't work. They're saying, yeah. I'm, I'm not asking you to be certain. I'm asking you to pick the one you think is probably going to be best and let's start moving forward. And that's not the way we've worked all the way up until we made that transition in the private sector. And that's one of the biggest frustrations, actually. It's one of the big gaps, right? 
So to bring it back to skills and knowledge, that's not a skill or a knowledge. That's not, that's not about transferable skills per se. That's about working habits. And yeah. yet that's one of the most frustrating things. One of the biggest gaps between uh, the technical teams, the PhD and the MBA, you might say, or the executives, mm -hmm. you know, the company. Yeah. It's interesting that, that, that you, you talk about uh, habits because it's, it's not a, it's not a point of view that I, that I've, you know, heard a lot. And I, and I think it's a, it's a really, really important and, and it's actually an easy one to grasp mm -hmm. uh, in a way, because, you know, it's not highfalutin terminology. It's, it's your habits. It's how you're, you, how you're used to doing things. Um, I'm really curious because of this experience you have talking with people who are hiring and with managers to go to go a little deeper because this question of um, the gaps that we bring as PhDs when someone is hiring us is a big is a black box for a lot of us. Yeah, we don't we don't know because we, people who are in these hiring positions are often not in our network. Uh, we may or may not have had informational interviews with people in the industry that we're looking into and if we haven't well again we we don't know uh where these these blind spots are um is there is there maybe a list of two so apart from this one which is a, which is a big one and it's it's easy to see how, where it stems from is there maybe two are there maybe you know two more uh, other key gaps that that you hear maybe that you know in, in order of of importance of or of frequency yeah so maybe i'll go back to the to the habits that i talk about because i think mm -hmm. those get right at the gaps um i mean the first one is i say here's how i usually phrase it uh scientists or phds who are successful in the private sector learn these mm -hmm. habits quickly and what are the habits the first one is they're focused on how to help their company make money. And that may sound obvious <laughs> when you think about it. Well, of course, companies make money. But again, it's a habit. It's not just the, the reason I talk about habits is habits are hard to change. And knowing that companies make money and saying, oh, sure, I need to help them make money is not the same as in your day-to-day -day work and your thinking and your decisions, are you incorporating that? Because we get so used to chasing an interesting problem. I, I remember all of these myself. <laughs> I remember the the pain every time the first five years in the private sector where I'd find myself wanting to dig into something really interesting because that's what I could do as a PhD. I even saw my value. That's my value is, you know, I'm smart. I can figure this out. And instead, stop and go, hang on. If I spend a week looking at this problem, does that help the company make money? I don't mm -hmm. think it does. <laughs> I need to put that aside and make sure that my work is focused on helping the company make money. Because if I don't do that, you know, we won't mm -hmm. be here next year. So that's that's one big habit. Uh, another one that I, I like because I, so I mentioned we have a, I, I'll talk about myself because <laughs> I know a lot of us are this way. We think of ourselves as smart. That's why we have a PhD, right? But we can get focused on needing to show we're smart and that can reduce uh it can reduce our ability to to get things done so i like the other habit or another habit i say is scientists phds who are effective in the private sector are effective not smart mm -hmm. it's a bit tongue-in-cheek <laughs> right of course it's valuable to be <laughs> smart but it's meant to focus again as a habit is, you know, what are you doing day to day? Are you trying to be smart? Or are you focused on how to get results being effective? This, both of these, two of the, th the three that I mentioned came from a particular manager I spoke to about five years ago, I think. I mm -hmm. was thinking about launching Turning Science. I've been doing this for a while and I was asking him. So he had been a CEO for about 20 years and had hired a lot of PhDs and I wanted to get his input on this. And he said, you know, 90% of PhDs struggle. And hmm. uh, he actually, he used the term, they're, they're worthless in industry, and which is a bit extreme, right? But it made well, the point. I, I've heard things like that. It, it is, and I had too. Nobody had said it quite so directly. But when I said, okay, what are some of the specific problems? First one he said is they always have to be the smartest one in the room. And that doesn't work in a team setting. You know, the, the PhD physicist can't come in and tell the, 
mechanical engineer with a bachelor's degree and 15 years of experience, a better way to do things. But I've seen it happen. You know, they're mm -hmm. focused on being smart rather than being effective. And the second one was the decisions. He said, I can't get them to make a recommendation because they want to collect more data and do more analysis. So anyway, those are that's some background on two of those three habits. But mm -hmm. those those three, they focus on how to help the company make money. They're effective, not just smart. And they make decisions without all the data they might like to have. They decide mm -hmm. quickly. Um, I think of kind of those as the big three. I think it's it's really interesting that those are the ones you, you pick up and they're, they're important. Um, I kind of want to go to the first one because, mm -hmm. and, to, and I will go to the others, but one of the things that when people go into science that they may imbue themselves with is the private is let's hear, let's use this word is dirty because there's mm -hmm. money. Yep. yep. And there's also money in research, but you know, it's, it's different and there's <laughs> right. no, you know, there's, but I'm sure you have examples of people who came from research, who went to industry, who are making money, but who are also bringing something to, to a community, to, to, uh, you know, to whatever, to a, whatever organization they're in, but that affects the society positively. Because I, I yes. think one of the things that I'd like to kind of break is this possible taboo of, oh, I'm, I'm, uh, uh, what's the expression in English? Uh, uh, man, it's, um, I'm signing my life to the man or what, I don't know the, ex the exact mm -hmm. expression because it's not my first language, but you're selling kind of, out, <laughs> selling out. Yeah. Selling yeah. out mm -hmm. might be one of the issues. Is it something you've seen the, when you've talked with possible candidates of having this feeling of ah, I'm selling out? Absolutely. Some people worry about that. And there unfortunately is absolutely that attitude in academia, not everyone in academia, mm -hmm. but some, uh, you know, where I've seen that the sharpest, is uh, I, I also work with scientists who are interested in research careers, but are interested in collaborating with the private sector. Mm -hmm. These are people who understand you can do both. And this is part of what led to the research and the development mindset. And I teach a workshop actually for postdocs who want to have research, academic research careers, but want to collaborate. And in doing that and preparing for that, I've spoken to a number of researchers who have built effective collaborations. So they, they work at a university, they have a often quite large research groups, research efforts, and some great industry collaborations. Many of them have said, my colleagues look down on me for taking mm. industry money. One I remember I met in uh, Brussels a few years ago said, some of my colleagues call me a prostitute for wow. taking money and not doing science. It's a very unfortunate attitude, uh, but it, 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 as you pointed out, it is not uh, justified either. I think when we, when people, many people think of, okay, industry is about profit. We think of the negative stories of corporate greed and people who end up cheating people out of money and trying to amass lots of wealth. Of course that happens. There's bad players, bad performers everywhere you go. But there are plenty of companies, and, and I have spoken to many people in these companies who are creating solutions. I mean, a perfect example. So for my, for my second book, I, I did a bunch of new interviews as well. Mm -hmm. I spoke to a woman who has a company, started a company in the Los Angeles area to develop a solution for prostate cancer. Okay. Excellent example, right? She's like, think about the, the men who are not only affected by this, their families, the people who love them. And we are on the verge of creating a solution that will help them. And of course, we have to turn a profit in order to be here and continue to do this next year. Of course. The profit is the way we get to that solution that will make the world better. And also it gives jobs to the people who are helping to do this, which is a positive mm -hmm. thing. So, you know, profit does not have to be dirty. You're absolutely right. Many people think of it that way and it's very mm -hmm. unfortunate. But the people that, that I find that have the best view of this are those, uh, some of the academic scientists who, who collaborate because they kind of see both sides of it. They understand, hey, there's value in pushing for new knowledge and doing basic mm -hmm. fundamental research that 
where we don't know if it's going to turn into something or not, because that's where tomorrow's solutions come from. Yeah. And there's value in working with companies to help them in whatever way we can, because they are creating the solutions. That's the, you know, the title of my first book, turning mm -hmm. science into things people need. I, I like that because that's what we're <clears throat> doing. Yes. Profit is part of it, but it's the things people need. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. the value. Yeah. And, and that is where, well, uh, that's where science gets its value, right? Yeah. If you publish a bunch of journal articles, they only really have true value when they're turned into a solution that helps humanity. So. Mm -hmm. And and eventually, you know, and, and you know, lots lots of people do PhDs, end up doing different things, and they put in, uh, you know, a one brick into the, the the wall of of science that one day will bring a solution. It's not right. immediate uh, research. When you're on the private side, you, the, again, there's a, a different time constraint that that you need to yes, <laughs> to try is. and and the things in in a, in a different time it's it's i think it's a really important conversation this one and it's it's um but i think the difficulty is to so to break this taboo is that uh or is in um the fact that often in phd programs there is no platform or no chance for young researchers to do an internship to talk with with people who are uh, you know who have startups and who maybe did the same phd program as they did um do you have you know and, and based on what you've researched the interviews you've done um because just i'm, I'm going to give you an example so in france there is a, a type of phd contract which is called cipher mm -hmm. which is specifically a contract for a PhD that's going to happen within a company. Mm -hmm. And it's it's not widespread. There's a growing number each year of Cypher contracts that are given. But I, I've talked to some of these people and it's a, a huge plus for them mm -hmm. because they are doing the research they wanted to do. So they're doing a PhD, but they do learn the culture. The culture. They do learn the social aspects, the social uh, uh, because like, like you said, there's some awkwardness in trying to be the smart person in the room, right? right. And they yes. learn that. They learn yes. that because they're on the floor, they're in the in the office. And so have you seen or or do you have, well, first, have you seen things like that happening around you of, uh, of programs offering platforms for young researchers to dip their toe in the in the pool in a way? Or is it some, you know, well, let, let's go with that question first. Yeah, I, I have seen some of it. I'm aware of the kinds of things you're talking about. Uh, I industry PhD is another term that is often used for that. Mm -hmm. I think it's a wonderful idea for exactly the reason you described. Mm -hmm. It is not common yet, um, but I look forward to that growing. It, it's interesting as you describe that, I can hear though objections from some people who would say, oh, but that's not what a PhD is for. You know, a PhD mm -hmm. is meant to groom next tomorrow's professors, tomorrow's academic mm -hmm. researchers. And that's some of that human tribal culture, I think, tribal nature coming in. It's unfortunate. Mm -hmm. A PhD can be for both. It, it, it then gets back to the research mindset, the development mindset. It doesn't have to be one or the other. We can groom PhDs that are planning academic careers. Mm -hmm. We can groom PhDs, the, the same strengths, the same independent mindset that will go into companies. There's value in both. And mm -hmm. we can groom PhDs that understand both and may choose to go back and forth. And mm -hmm. this is exactly what the professors, the researchers who do industry collaborations have kind of grown on their own, right? That's mm -hmm. where they develop. They've on their own said, hey, I see both have value. I see that I don't have to go into only one or the other. Mm -hmm. I can recognize and embrace the value of both. And maybe there's actually a synergy there instead of saying it's one or the other, mm -hmm. you know, industry is good, academia is bad, academia is good, industry is bad. It's a, it's a synergy. Knowledge is developed and is turned into a solution. And if we embrace both, understand both, and a, and a versatile scientist can go back and forth. We're, we're supposed to be smart. We ought to be able to figure both <laughs> environments out and adapt from one to the other. There's no reason yeah. we have to do only one. So uh, I, 
I drifted a bit from the topic of the industry PhD, but that I think that is, I think th as that grows, that will develop the credibility that yes, a PhD can work in industry. There's things they can do. It's not mm -hmm. monotonous work as sometimes people hear. Uh, it is absolutely a different way to be creative yeah. and uh, independent and yeah. Great it's interesting idea. you talk about creativity because uh, I'm, I'm thinking of my interview with uh, Jonathan Weitzman in, in uh, University in Paris, and he's he believes in that fully. And he's one of those. He at a certain point he left academia and then came back within a year, but to go, you know to go to industry. But what happened is after coming back, he's now still a professor, but he kept really close contacts with industry. Some of his students now have startups, and he mm -hmm. brings his students to visit. And you know it's he it, it, it's such 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 an enrichment to his experience as a professor, but to his yes. students as, as being students. And the, one other point that I, that I wanted to, you know, to, to comment com coming from what you said is, yes, people are groomed to be professors, but there are only so many spots as professors right now. <laughs> That's right. So why not open up the, the gamut of, of what we're grooming people for a little bit to allow them to successfully transition later on to this other world that's uh, a little bit different. I, I think that's really true. You know, sometimes I have heard, oh, we're creating too many PhDs now in the world. Well, if you assume that PhDs should go into academia, that would be true. Mm -hmm. But if you look much more broadly at what a PhD is, it's not about, it's not necessarily about learning a specific research path and then continuing that. If, if that's your view, yeah, it seems like it's it's overdone or, or maybe yeah. even a waste. If instead you see that a PhD teaches somebody how to think independently, be creative, solve problems, those skills are useful in so many places. It's about yeah. having a broader view. And there are, I think, three general things that we're seeing now, trends, um, in academia that actually are pushing that. And I like to see it. One is the industry PhD. Mm -hmm. One are, is the uh, second one is the professors, the researchers that do collaborate. And the third you mentioned is the growing startup culture in some universities. Yeah. All of those are bringing greater awareness and significance uh, to recognition for the private sector, kind of a, an awareness that not only is it there, but it is a good thing and it is a valuable career path in parallel to academia. Yeah, yeah, no, it, it's true. And it's it's good to see uh, uh, these things happening, mm -hmm. but uh, it's not widespread yet. And, and you know, there's there's work to be done uh, more like systemically so that, because what, what happens often and... Uh, I don't know if people who come to you talk about this, but a lot of people end up, well, there's people who end up quitting PhDs and mm -hmm. there's reasons for that for sure. But, you know, uh, mental health issues in, in, you know, young researchers are, the numbers are, I was going to say staggering, but they're, they're substantial. Yeah. And the one of the facts that I believe is important in that is the insecurity of not knowing Especially if you realize I'm not going to be a professor and then, mm -hmm. okay, how do I figure out what I'm going to be next if I didn't prepare for these two, three, four, I, what, whichever years before. This is why what you do, I think it's really inspiring and and I, I really always want to showcase people who are trying to help people and, and, you know, and graduate researchers and PhDs find their place in a world that they might at first think, okay, I don't belong here. Yeah. That's uh, it's an excellent point. That is, if I had to pick one aspect of what I try to do, <laughs> it's to help PhDs see that moving out of academia is not a plan B. It's so unfortunate that many of us see it that way. There you go. It's terribly unfortunate. Uh, we come in with this vision that we should be a professor. And many of us actively want that when we start our graduate careers. And that's fine, yeah. often because that's really the only thing we see. And as a physicist, I just knew, well, that's what a physicist does. A scientist becomes yeah. a professor, right? <laughs> exactly. Um, and either we realize as we 
watch our professors. This is this was my story. I watched my advisor and the other professors as I went through graduate my graduate studies and realized I don't think that is the career that I want. I want something more dynamic and varied. It's fine mm -hmm. for them. That's great. It's not for me. Uh, and decided I want something different. Some of us realize, ooh, it's a very competitive job market for very few professor positions. Mm -hmm. What are the chances I'll get it? But in many of those cases, unfortunately, many of us end up feeling like, ah, oh, I've done this for nothing to, to exaggerate it, right? Or I've done it for, you know, that is so unfortunate. And if there's one message I try to get out there, this is not the case. I understand you may be thinking that, and I understand why you may be thinking mm -hmm. that because few people in academia understand industry and there's not enough respect for it, but it is absolutely not the case. Mm -hmm. And I try to help them look at their strengths, their experience, their PhD, what it means and find there are plenty of things you can do. That's, yeah. that's one of the reasons I like the interviews bring me a lot of stories. The people I talk to bring stories. So it's not just me saying, well, here's my career path. And I've found so <laughs> many fun, exciting things to do with my degree. I never felt it was a waste, even though I didn't even do a postdoc, but I've got plenty of other stories of people too, who take that mm -hmm. experience and they turn it into something other than what they might have imagined. And it's absolutely rewarding, absolutely exciting, and absolutely makes a difference in the world, yeah. which is what most of them wanted to do. Uh, uh, th this makes me think of, 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 of uh, the next question, because I do think when we start a PhD, we want to we want to have an impact on science, you know, on whatever domain. But eventually, we want to have an impact on society, and and this I you know we haven't talked about questions or anything. And you know, if you don't have an answer, it's fine. But from your standpoint, and to kind of help these you know people who might be thinking, oh man, I just wasted six years of my life, uh, and uh, the society doesn't need what I trained for. What are tendencies? What are let's say one or two big questions that society is facing today from your standpoint and, and from what you know of the industry that the industry is going to to tackle and that PhDs are going to be able to lend a hand and make a difference in today in 2021. So excellent question. Um, I guess what I would say is not so much specific technologies or maybe specific specific problems, but the two things that a PhD can do outside of academic research is solve problems. And, and if that sounds vague and generic, it is. And I mean that intentionally because you can apply your problem solving skills and experience to almost anything. Mm -hmm. And so that is one of them. The other is uh, independence, independent learning. I mean, both of these good critical problem solving skills and a true independent approach, able to learn on your own. And in, in the era now where so much information and disinformation is available, the ability to critically think about what's right and what's not, what's true and mm -hmm. what's not is important. The ability to take a vague concept and turn it into a real plan, which is what most of us did for our PhD. Mm -hmm. The ability, the confidence to say, you know, nobody's done this before, but I can probably do it because, again, that's what most of us did for our PhDs. That is the real value in the PhD degree. Mm -hmm. And the, none of those things are ever wasted. If no matter what you do in your career, you can find ways to leverage those strengths. Mm -hmm. Independence, problem solving, confidence, uh, an ability to turn a vague concept into a plan and execute it. Where is that not valuable? Mm -hmm. And so what that actually, that perspective does is it shifts somebody's mentality from, oh my, I'm not going to be a professor. So I wasted my degree to, oh, wow, I didn't appreciate the strengths that I both developed and have proven mm -hmm. can be leveraged in almost anything I want to do that it opens <laughs> up a whole new set of, of career options, of possibilities. life options, possibilities. Yes. But a question for you, and again, depending on, on, you know, the managers, what industries the managers you talk with are in, but what industries are, you know, want PhDs or will want PhDs in the next five to 10 years that mm -hmm. people listening might not be, might not suspect that there's a place for them in there. 
Uh, you know, there's a lot going on in the life sciences. I'm very excited by it. And I know that's still broad. But if you think of life sciences, whether it's uh, synthetic biology, whether it's creating, you know, vaccines and medicines. And, uh, you know, I'm so excited by what's going on with uh, DNA work, generally speaking, whether it's mm -hmm. mRNA or um, CRISPR technologies. But just yeah. broadly speaking, we are learning so much in the life sciences. And I've known a lot of people that have moved into that from other areas. So back to a PhD in some other discipline mm -hmm. might still find a great spot there for two reasons. One, we can learn new skills and new knowledge quickly. We've done that. And yeah. two, uh, just to go back to the example of the life sciences, it is incorporating so many other things as it grows. For example, I know a lot of fellow physicists who have moved into uh, the life sciences, many have started companies okay. that are bioscience companies, and maybe they're using uh, some photonics technology as part of the technology, but they're creating another solution. Uh, another mm -hmm. interview I did was a woman who's a PhD in physics, worked with lasers, but she and her colleague developed a way of inserting CRIS using a laser to insert CRISPR into a cell, oh, wow. <laughs> accomplishing a challenge there, right? I don't know how much she, I mean, she's, she's not a biologist, she's a physicist. And yet mm -hmm. we moving forward with that confidence that I can probably learn what I need and I can get people to help me. And she moved forward, started a company in Boston, Massachusetts, and she and her wow. partner are off and running with that. So uh, those are some of the most exciting ones as an aside. Sometimes I, I wish I had gotten into life sciences more. It's such a, an amazing frontier. So that's a big one mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. uh, I think of. Um, and that has affected us as a society in the last year or so hugely. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And the promise for where it will go now that many of us are more comfortable with that. And there's mm -hmm. a, a realization that this really holds a lot of promise. Boy, I think the next decade is going to be very fun to watch. Yeah, definitely. For that reason. Plus, <clears throat> plus we're facing different like, planet-wide issues, be them social, uh, climate change, etc. That, you know, these are huge problems with many variables that yes. I think the PhD profile, be it in social sciences or, you know, in climate sciences or physics or, or you know, mm -hmm. whatever, are, you know, is a, is a, the format that that we come out out with the formatting we come out with in terms of thinking and of solving solving problems i believe uh, it's going to it's going to make people who come with this training and who want to do something more directly applied to what's happening today they'll find where you know they or they'll build because we didn't talk about entrepreneurship and we're reaching the end of the interview but one thing we didn't think we didn't talk and you just mentioned it is PhDs are actually going and launching their companies based on, <laughs> uh, on their research. Absolutely. One of the workshops I do is, can a scientist be a successful entrepreneur? Uh. And the answer is yes. <laughs> the answer is absolutely. Uh, I've had people say, in fact, I remember posting something. I forget where I posted it, uh, suggesting this. And the first comment actually started with, ahem. <laughs> and then said, these are very scientists and entrepreneur are very different careers. And one person can't do both. I, I just thought it was so interesting. He actually typed out, ahem. <laughs> <laughs> but there is absolutely a thought that we can't do both. I've got plenty of data, plenty of interviews sure to suggest we absolutely <laughs> can. That is such an exciting career path for many. Talk about turning science into things people need, creating your own idea and yeah. moving forward with it. And being an entrepreneur is absolutely uh, a career path that requires somebody with an independent thinking, ability to learn on their own, and actually an ability to be effective, not smart. They have to, what it's important to learn and understand things themselves, but they have to know to depend on other people as well and not try yeah. to do it all themselves. <laughs> Great career opportunity to make a difference in the world. And, uh, you know, you we we you're asking about specific areas. You mentioned a couple more. Um, the environment is a really important one. I think just in, I don't know, I don't have a term for this, but disinformation is something that is much more on my mind lately. That's mm -hmm. not an industry. It's not a market. It's not a, but somehow we all have to deal with this, yeah. and we need some 
creative, intelligent people to work on this problem. Uh, some of it has been created by people with a technology background, obviously, at wanting to do good, and now we see where it goes. I, I think that is a, an opportunity for some PhDs to really make a difference. Yeah. Um, I mentioned life sciences already. I'm impressed. I do a lot of workshops, uh, and I'm impressed with the number of people that are working on new cancer solutions. And I, okay. I think there's some really promising Health. technologies. Boy, that that sounds so exciting. Yeah. Uh, yeah. All of these are opportunities, and many of them are starting companies to try and push a specific solution forward. It's it's very exciting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I agree, and and I think it's it's a good point to kind of finish the interview in on a on a positive note, mm -hmm. uh, because th it's true that and I've seen this comment first. Uh, I I was just in a converse in a Twitter exchange uh, lately, uh, and I was you know kind of saying PhDs equal PhD equals entrepreneur to kind of say that it's you know a PhD naturally can become an entrepreneur. And the conversation was, I tried to nuance things and say, well, not everyone, first, not everyone, be it, be them researchers or not, have this entrepreneurship right. uh, gene, <laughs> sure, let's say. Sure. And it's the same thing within PhDs. Some are, some will be, will thrive there, some won't. So I think it's an important point. But um, uh, I think finishing it on a good note that there's, there's place and there's problems to be solved. There's big problems to be solved in society and that part of them have to be solved or will be solved in, in the private sector uh, or at least not in academia and that's okay mm -hmm. and you can you can be part of it you can be a you can be a professional um, researcher a research scientist within a company within a pharma there's so many places where you can thrive and and contribute but david first uh, i'm i'm running your uh, website mm -hmm. uh, here below um I, I really want you to kind of pitch your new book that's coming out, share the date of when it's coming out, uh, talk like a minute on what it's about. And I think we kind of covered a bunch of it during our conversation, but mm -hmm. yeah, take this, these next uh, few minutes, these next uh, one or two minutes to, to talk about what's coming up on your side. All right. Well, thank you. Well, so it's an extension of my first book. My first one's turning science into things people need. But this I wrote before I really knew much about this field. I interviewed a bunch of scientists who had transitioned to the private sector and put their stories in here. Mm -hmm. Now, fast forward 11 years from there, actually 10 years, I guess, pandemic hit. I realized I wasn't going to be traveling for a while because that's most of what I do yeah. is travel and give workshops and, and training. And I thought, now's the time to write the book where I put my own ideas into it. Mm -hmm. And one of, as I thought about what are some of the themes I've learned, one of the biggest ones that wraps all this together is we PhDs, we scientists, when we move into the private sector, we still think in terms of finding a right answer, think mm -hmm. of, of a formula or a checklist. And that captures a lot of the habit differences, the gap between how we've been trained and how the private sector needs us to function. And I realized it's like a game. You know, a game is something where there's no single right answer. There mm -hmm. are many ways to win and you have to find your own. A game is about taking risk. You have to take a shot or you have to play your hand in cards or move your chess piece. You don't know if you're going to get it or not. You have to decide quickly, take the shot. And if it doesn't work, you try again. That's what the private sector is about. Mm -hmm. And also knowledge isn't enough to be successful. We get used to the more we know, the more powerful we are in a research environment, right? In the private sector, there's a lot of people that know how to play the game and they realize knowledge is valuable, but it's not everything. Mm -hmm. I like to say, in a, to go back to the game analogy, knowing the rules better than anyone does not make you a professional player. That's how you become a referee. But mm -hmm. you, you have to know the rules, but sometimes the best players are the ones that know the rules and then find their way to win. Mm -hmm. around that yeah and and that that goes back to learn to the rules are those habits and things mm -hmm. in part of them is that what you mentioned before when is it coming out exactly when can when and where can people get the book so it should be this month i wish i had a specific date to give okay you. it will be on amazon is the best place uh, <clears throat> watch my website it's the great thing so within within this month by the end of october i should have a link um but it'll, like i say it'll be on amazon uh 
it's uh, published through SPIE is a professional optics society, but um, mm -hmm. yeah. And so it basically it, it expands on the habits. It gives two more habits that we didn't have time to talk about. It talks about entrepreneurship as a game. Your career is a game. Uh, it talks more about the research and development mindsets. All of these things we've touched on are covered in great detail in that book. Excellent. Well, uh, David, uh, before I kind of kind of sum up what we talked about, do you have uh, because you talked about COVID, and I, I'm sure this uh, this whole crisis hit people hard in terms of you know uh, starting a transition that they were planning for their professional yeah. life, uh, getting hired or not, getting the position they wanted. Um, do you have any uh, any words of uh, of inspiration for someone who's maybe still you know doing research thinking their future might be somewhere else doubting themselves maybe a little bit is there is there something you'd like to to share with them at the end of this conversation to kind of motivate them and 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 pr propel them to the next chapter yeah so i guess the first point i would make is that your phd is worth much more than you might realize it's not just the knowledge it's all these strengths and these skills that we've talked about that are absolutely valuable uh, in many different areas. But when, and then in thinking about it, especially given that we've, many of us have been, had setbacks, right? We had, yeah. a, we might've had a plan and we've run into setbacks. One of the things I've learned to think about is when you run into a setback, you can let it drag you down. There's three ways you can deal with it. You can let it drag you down. You can get through it and go, whew, boy, that was, bad, but at least it's over. Or the third way is you can actually embrace the challenge and think, how can I use that to build something that wouldn't have otherwise happened? I mean, I did that with the book. I thought, oh, I, I, I normally travel. I, I was planning on spending much of the 2020 in Europe delivering workshops that all yeah. went away for the first nine months. So right. I found a different way to make something of it. But I, the way I sum it up, I like to say, what story would you like to tell down the road when you look back? Mm -hmm. Do you want to look back and say, boy, that pandemic was awful and I'm just glad it's over? Okay. Or would you rather say, hey, this was something I didn't plan, but I found a way to leverage it into something. And I decided how I was going to make that story. I decided what story I wanted to tell afterwards. Mm -hmm. And that's what I developed. Hey, that's, that's great. It's a great point. I just have one last thing mm -hmm. to, to ask you, which is if... So are you now? Uh, so are, are are you able now to give um, to give workshops uh, at least uh, around where you are? Uh, is, is that has that resumed yet? It it actually has. So two comments. First of all, by the end of 2020, I was doing everything online, even two day workshops. You know, I my initial thought was, how do I do these online? But I figured that out. That's part of the story, and so I deliver even my two day workshop content through Zoom. Okay. Okay. But I also am able to travel again. I've started traveling again, even internationally. Um, and uh, so I am embracing both now. That's part That's of the story good. is uh, I can do them virtually and I can do them in person. And mm. uh, in my workshop, my, sorry, my website details many of the things that I do. Uh, and I'm happy to uh, travel if that's Excellent. what somebody's interested in and happy to do them online as well. Great. So I so what I wanted to say is, if you've been inspired by my conversation with David David Giltner, this the website is is here. Oh, I think I see it here. Yeah. I have to get used to this. <laughs> uh, and uh, and there you go. And I and uh, go to the website uh, if you want to to get him to come to to where you are to give a workshop. I guess the website is the place to go to. Yes. Yes. The books, the new book. We're all expecting it, but there's the first book that you can the, that you can go read. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think the the big take home message for me, David, and, and this is going to be the, the last few words, and you can comment if you if you want after, but there's gaps mm -hmm. but we can fill those gaps we especially after a phd learning is the thing we do mm -hmm. so yes. the hopeful message that i got from all we talked is people when they see a phd arrive from industry might expect this gap or that gap or that gap mm -hmm. and they have uh, let's say historical reasons to to do so to think so mm -hmm. oh yeah but mm -hmm. but we as phds we as PhD programs or as or, or, or as you know research institutes, we can uh, we can fill those gaps 
before the transition arrives yeah. and this is why it's with workshops it's with reading good books but i think also very importantly it's talking with people who are on the other side of the fence yes Get, bringing them to the institutes uh you know uh, bringing alumni let's say of your program who are now mm -hmm. a startup ceo and and have and talking with them and understanding what their experience was what they learned mm -hmm. people stories like you said you know your first book was filled with stories of people that's it's a little bit what i do here on papa phd yeah so i think it's a very hopeful message i really appreciate what you're doing i really appreciate the, um, the structured view you have of this and I'm, i'm really thankful that you came on the show well thank you for having me this was really fun to talk to you i really appreciate the invitation and i This has been a great time to uh, talk to you about something I care a lot about and I think is important for so many PhDs. It, it, there's so many exciting, rewarding career options. If you're feeling like you wasted your time getting a PhD, oh my God, it's not true. Uh, there's so many things you can do. I much more positive approach is available. I couldn't Absolutely. agree more. David Gildner, yeah. thank you so much for having come on the show and uh, all the best for for. 2021-2022. Thank you. Same to you. <laughs> There you go. So this is, we finished the live taping uh, yeah. uh, per se. I, I think it went really well. I'm really, really happy. And I, I really feel that there's a commonality on how we think about uh, things. And I'm uh, really, really glad. And I guess, I don't know if, you, if I told you, but I saw you on uh vera chan's video on youtube ah, yes right that's right. that was the link because i i'm you know i'm pretty i i know vera pretty well mm -hmm. and she's been and uh super happy that i saw that video and that i i learned about you because you know it's the internet is so huge <laughs> that mm -hmm. it's not a given that you'll know everyone that kind of has the same <laughs> mission as as you do so it's It's great. It's really I really great. enjoyed reaching out to contact other people who do similar things. I did this back in 2017 when I started turning science. That was the mm -hmm. first step I took. I, who else is doing this? And I'm, mm -hmm. I'm very internationally inclined. You know, it's one of the principles of turning science is make the world smaller. I just, yeah, uh, many reasons I won't go into. But, and you know, somebody uh, in there was a guy in the UK and a guy in Spain and a guy in Australia. Um, Uh, anyway, so I met Vera later. It was so great to get to catch up with her in person in Paris. Uh, I guess it's now about five weeks ago. Yeah. So that's very fun. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Very cool. It's, uh, so, yeah, she's, she's this, really interesting. She is. Yeah. 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 And, and, uh, she, she's like, she's like working on her YouTube channel and, and, you know, doing, <laughs> using the new formats. I'm, I'm just newly investing more on, on, on being on camera and being on YouTube. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, no, and, and she's, a, she's a very nice person too. But yeah, yeah I was I was really happy first that you were available, and I know we had a date change, etc. But super super happy after this conversation, it really surpassed my expectations by by a lot. <laughs> well, great! I, I thank you again for doing it. I, I really enjoy these conversations. You know, I a central theme in what the questions you were asking is: we need to make a difference in how PhDs are trained and not just how they're trained, but more the trajectory that they see for themselves. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We don't give them enough of a, a solid impression that there are many things you can do. It's not just a professor. It's so unfortunate. Yeah, That's the waste. And so the work that you were doing, the work that Vera is doing, and hopefully the work that I'm doing, really mm -hmm. th there's value in changing the perspective. And the more we get out there, the more that perspective changes. Yeah, so, and yeah, it's true. The thing that I've noticed, even live, you know, with students is if they're first year students, it's very hard to get the message through because they just started. They're still yeah. maybe dreaming of, you know, doing making a huge breakthrough in their in their subject, uh, in the subject field and whatever, whatever. Uh, but if there's a lot of this content out there, the moment an inkling comes to them that, okay, I need to look at something else, they'll find it and eventually they'll be inspired and they'll be inspired to take the right action. Because th then that's the next step is, what action do I take if I'm somewhere where nothing's offered? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that's where people get lost and get maybe anxious. Yeah. Is, okay, yeah. I, I woke up today and I felt, okay, research is not my professional future. 
Mm -hmm. So what do I do? And some in some universities, universities, there's there's things happening. There's yeah. actually great things happening in some of them, but it's not everywhere. So mm -hmm. uh, that's why I'm here. That's why I think you're there. And, uh, and it's it's great to, to get to meet you and to kind of grow my this this PhD help, like help family kind of thing. I think it's it, yeah, <laughs> it, absolutely right. The more we do this, the more we get towards a critical mass, you know, it's, it's it. the cooperative power of you know when i get together with vera i get together with you or i get together with some of these other people doing similar things it, there's real value in that they, yeah. we're helping people and the more we increase the awareness the more it gets better on its own you're you know you mentioned the question of what can people do now when they realize this whether their university is helping them or not that's a whole other topic i mean if, if you ever want to do another one of these one day maybe <laughs> that would be a topic what do you do you know yeah because uh, i i i have i do that as well so many PhDs don't think about this until like the last year of their exact. Degree. That was my experience. <laughs> Mine too. One of the things I've really enjoyed, a lot of my workshop business has been in Germany, actually. Okay. Because there is a real culture around training. Every research group, you know, they have these kind of hierarchical research groups that mm -hmm, are kind mm -hmm. of traditional, right? But the benefit is each of them has a budget for training. And each of them has a coordinator. It's usually the junior professor. They say, okay, here's a budget. Go arrange career training for the PhDs. But because of that, in my workshops, I get a lot of people who aren't in their last year who are thinking, gee, it seems like when people come to these, they start thinking about their career ahead of time mm -hmm. and there's a benefit. And I say, yes, absolutely. Yeah. And so I'm able to <laughs> point them in that direction. In the three years you have left, here's what you can do so you're better prepared. You know, because there's a, it's like a, it's like a, um, a compounding investment. Exactly. You know, the early you make a change, the more it grows. And if you have three years left, that's awesome because you can start thinking about your career and planning for it. You know, yeah. I say one of the big things you can do is run your project with a plan, a mm -hmm. schedule and milestones and, and give yourself deadlines. Because if you're telling that story in an interview that, yes, I've done this for the last three years, so much better than. Well, I just woke up last month and realized I need to find a job in industry. And so here I am, you know, much yeah. better story. And uh, so it's been really cool to be able to do that there. Here in the U.S., it's hard to find universities that appreciate this mm -hmm. now. You know, careers, it's usually the career centers that are responsible for that. And yeah. these are people who have never spent time in industry. They've just made a career of being a career counselor. And so they focus on transferable skills and a CV and a cover letter. And that's all and fine. You, there you go. Yeah. But they miss these other really important things. And, and, I, and I've seen also a tendency of getting uh, students to do this, mm -hmm. to, 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 to play this role. You know, students that are later in the, in the path to, yeah. to do the, And it's not the same. Right. It's not the same. I mean, one of my call it selling points from a business standpoint is I'm not somebody who made a career telling you how to write a PhD, uh, sorry, a, a, a CV. Mm -hmm. I have experience in the private sector. I know I've hired and managed people just like you in the job you'd like to get. And I can mm -hmm. tell you what somebody needs as a manager, you know, that, that kind of a thing. So mm -hmm. Just want to thank uh, Matei and Anka. Matei on Facebook and Anka on LinkedIn. She's just said uh, great insights, and th they are great insights. And I think it's they're important conversations. And uh, you know what? I'm going to take you up on that uh, that suggestion, and we'll talk again. I'm if if you're you know up for it, I sure. definitely have kind of a more of a more actionable item type conversation about this for sure. But yeah, now we've great. like we've passed uh, the hour. Okay. Uh, I, I, I think, uh, I don't know about you, but, uh, I think, uh, I could spend another hour with you just chatting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, but, hopefully uh, yeah. we get to meet in person someday too. That'd be great. Oh, that'd you be know, great. Yeah, that'd be great. That'd where, be great. And you? it's, I'm in Montreal, where, Montreal, Canada. Okay. Uh, yeah. I was there two years ago. Hopefully I get back soon. There you go. If you're, if you're in town for sure, let's meet, uh, you're, where are you? Bo Boulder, Colorado. Boulder, Colorado. Oh, or near Denver. It's just 30 minutes from Denver. So yeah. yeah. If you ever make it okay. to Colorado. Okay. Okay. Well, if I make it to Colorado, I'll definitely go visit you. David, <laughs> this was great. I had a, I, I just not, not only fun and, and like, a, you know, a good, hopeful 
and positive feeling, but a lot of great information, uh, uh, you know, coming from not a, you know your experience, your investigations on what you've written. So, I think uh, people uh, people have a lot to take from this conversation of ours. And and I'm you know thanks again for having accepted to to come on the show. You're very welcome, and I'm glad you enjoyed it. And thank you for the invitation. I can say this is uh, this is an important topic, and it was great to get to it talk is. to you here for this hour. So, thank you very much. Same here. Thank you, and uh, and we'll keep in touch for sure. Excellent. Looking forward to that. Cheers, and uh, all Take the best care. for the launch. Thank you. Yes, I'm excited to get it out there and start <laughs> marketing it. All right, and tell me when it when it it's uh, it's out, and I'll you know I'll repost. Uh, let's say let repost the the our conversation with the new link. Some you know, I'm gonna help you try and launch that a little bit. More, I appreciate that. You know, to yeah, widen will, the net a little bit. <laughs> I appreciate that. And I will absolutely be posting that on LinkedIn too. So that's that's my primary social media uh, outlet. And so I'll, I will be posting that there too. All right. Excellent. Cheers. See you soon. Cheers. Take care. Take care.